wrong. Wrong has been normalized in our society. People talk about things that you should have shut up. They talk about it as not even a joke, it's a conversation. Talking about the opposite gender, talking about shows that depict wrong and nasty stuff. We're talking about, hey, did you watch the GOT last night? Yeah, it was good. How can we talk about this stuff? Society will be plagued with poison when people of goodness don't present goodness. Don't blame America. Don't blame the society. Don't blame she thought. Blame yourself because you didn't produce goodness. You only produce space for flaws and evil to flourish. Shaitan could right now be sipping on his pina colada in Mexico on the beach of Cancun for two years and come back and guess what? His work went tenfold. And he didn't work. Why? Because we're not doing the good. We're not doing evil. We're just not doing the good. So what do you do? You now find out your sins when you rewind it. You found it. Now guess what? Finish your fast with repentance and pledge to Allah, I'm not going to do this anymore. Write it down, everyone. Write these things down. I was backbiting. I got hungry. I looked at something wrong. I got hungry. I said something wrong to my spouse. I got hungry. I scolded my child. I became hungry. Write it down. Now you know your sin. So tomorrow it's not going to go on shaitan. The third thing is, uh, the final thing I talk about barakah, you'll, you'll experience barakah in Ramadan, where you eat a little, and Allah will allow that little to take your whole day forward. You'll be at Maghrib and you'll still feel strong. You'll still feel healthy. You'll still feel energized. Why? Because Allah is telling you, 11 months you gave to your stomach and your body, right? 11 months we worry about the supplements, the medication, the diet, the food, the clothing, the cream. We worry about our body. 11 months. How many months are gone? 11. Now this is one month for your soul. Do you know your soul is also important? Do you know your soul has more power than your body does? Do you know that spiritual energy is a thing? Do you know spiritual power is a thing? These 30 days Allah will allow you in 30 days to do 300 days worth of work and revamp it and rectify it and recharge it and allow it to run you. Remember, this body is a car. The driver is one of two. The nuts or the soul. The body will go where your nuts tells you, your inner carnal desires, or your soul, your spirit of goodness will tell you where to go. Regardless who is the driver, the car will never say no. The car will go where the driver takes them. Eleven months our body was driving the car. Our nuts was driving the car. Give thirty days for your soul to drive the car. Feel the spiritual energy and power. That's one thing Ramadan will give you that I promise you nothing else will give you. With that, I hand it back to Sheikh Hassan who will finally who will finish the final topic of today, which is deeds. What are the deeds that are known in this blessed month of Ramadan? And then, inshallah, we will open up to questions and answers, inshallah. All right, so we're going to stretch again. Everybody stand up. 30 seconds, inshallah. I'm not running. I'm just going to go to the bathroom, everyone, please. So don't think I'm running away, okay? Uh, I'll be back. I'm here for your questions because we've got some really good, interesting questions. So excuse me, please. All right. All right, we can sit back down, inshallah. <coughs> so like Imam Azhar said, uh, we received some questions. We're going to do the Q&A at the end, inshallah. Uh, probably right after I finish this segment. Uh, Imam Azhar comes back. We'll do the Q and A right after that, inshallah. Ta'ala. So, what are the things that are recommended that we do in the month of Ramadan? The first thing that I want to tell you that you should focus on in the month of Ramadan beyond fasting, okay? Beyond fasting, the first thing that you should focus on in the month of Ramadan is you perfect your obligations. 
perfect your obligations. So if you are a person who is not used to praying five times a day, in Ramadan you have to make a promise to yourself that you will pray five times a day on time. Every salah is going to be on time. And if for whatever reason you miss a prayer, you have to make it up. That has to be your number one goal for Ramadan. For 30 days consecutively, I'm going to pray my prayers on time. If you are a person who uh, zakat is due on you, tell yourself, Ramadan, I'm going to pay my zakat. I'm not going to delay it any, any, any more than that. Okay, so perfect your obligations. That's number one. And I'm going to give you 14 things, inshallah. So that's number one, if you want to write these down. Number two. So number one was perfect your obligations. Number two. Give up your sins. Ramadan is that month of change. If we're not going to change in Ramadan, when are we going to change? Start with the most major sins. Start with the sins that are persistent. That you do persistently. And start with those sins that you do publicly. Those need your immediate attention. Because those are sins that Allah doesn't just forgive. Those are serious. Focus on them. That's number two. Number three. Alhamdulillah, if you are good with your obligatory prayers, if you're already, alhamdulillah, have a habit of praying regularly on time, then for you, your goal should be to incorporate the sunnah prayers in your lifestyle. In Ramadan, you make it a, a promise to yourself that I am not going to miss the witr prayer which is wajib in the Hanafi school and sunnah in the other schools. I'm not going to miss the witr prayer. I'm not going to miss the two sunnah before fajr. I'm not going to miss the four rak'ah before dhuhr and the two after dhuhr. I'm not going to miss two rak'ah after maghrib. I'm not going to miss two rak'ah after isha. These are sunnah mu'akkada. Emphasize sunnahs. Make them a part of your daily routine in the month of Ramadan. If you can do it for 30 consecutive days, then hopefully, inshallah, it will stay with you. Okay? And if you are a person who already does that, alhamdulillah, then your goal should be to try to do more of your prayers in congregation. Try to do more of your prayers in congregation. If you don't pray once every day in the masjid, Make that a goal. That I'm going to pray at least one prayer in congregation every day. If you already pray one every day in the masjid, take it up a notch and tell yourself I'm going to pray two every day in the masjid. And so on. So that's number three. Number four. Wake up for suhoor every day. And like Imam Azhar said, eat something light. Doesn't should not be a meal, should not be a cooked meal. Suhoor. Suhoor is not to fill up the stomach. That's not the point of suhoor. The point of suhoor is baraka. It's to get that secret divine uh, blessing that is in that food. Suhoor can simply be a few sips of water. It can be a few sips of water. But don't skip out on suhoor. If you skip out on suhoor, you're skipping out on something that is blessed. And you will feel its negative impact on your fasting in the day. Don't be like the person who says, you know what, Fajr is too early, so I'm going to sleep through. I'm going to get up right like 15 minutes before sunrise to catch my Fajr. I don't need to eat suhoor because I already ate a heavy iftar. No, don't do that. doesn't matter what you ate for iftar. Eat less during iftar. And get up for suhoor. And suhoor is not midnight. 12 o'clock midnight. That's not suhoor. Suhoor is from sahar. And sahar is the time before dawn. That's what sahar means. Okay? So it has to be close to dawn. The Prophet 
encouraged people to delay their suhoor as close to Fajr time as possible. Because that time is blessed and that meal is blessed. Number five. Break your fast with other people instead of doing that alone. Break your fast with your family members. On, on days when we have community iftar, come and break your fast with the rest of the community. On days when there's youth iftar, come and have iftar with the rest of the youth of your community. Ramadan is an excellent opportunity to get to know your brothers and sisters and build bonds of brotherhood. So take advantage of this. But at the same time, do not overeat for iftar. Because the essence of fasting, inshallah, we'll have another opportunity maybe next week to talk about this. The essence of fasting is to eat less. If we don't do that, then the fast will not be effective. And we're going to miss out on the many benefits of Ramadan. So do iftar every day with your family, with your brothers and sisters, but eat moderately, eat less. When you, alhamdulillah, are ending your fast, don't... You know, you break your fast, don't shatter your fast. Like you take a fast and you slam it on the ground and shatter it with like all of these meals and all of these drinks. Don't do that. And then you go to Taraweeh and you're complaining that Taraweeh is too long because you're feeling lazy and heavy and sleepy. Don't do that. Number six. Ramadan is an excellent month to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You should have a daily word of tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every day, find time to be alone, raise your hands, count your sins. Count your sins before Allah. Allah knows them, but He wants to hear it from you. So tell Allah, Ya Allah, I know I have done this. I know I have done this. And I know there are many things that I don't even recall that I have done. Ya Allah, please forgive me. Ramadan is an excellent month to do that. So do that every day. If you can do it any time during the day, it's great. But especially at times when dua is answered, like when you are about to break your fast. And that brings me to number seven. Be in dua. A lot of dua in the month of Ramadan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about dua when he talks about the fasting at Ramadan. In the middle of that he talks about dua. And the dua of a fasting person is accepted while he's fasting and when he ends his fast. So ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all of your needs. Especially the needs that you have that will get you to Jannah. Ask for those needs. If you are finding it difficult to overcome a certain bad, bad habit, Ask Allah to help you. This is the time to make dua. Number eight. Engage the Qur'an. Read as much as you can in the month of Ramadan. If you can read one juz every day, that would be wonderful. If you can read more, even better. If you can not read more but read less, okay, that's fine. But make it a regular habit to read Qur'an every day. Read a portion of the Qur'an every day. Even if it is just a few ayats. And don't just spend this month reading the Qur'an without understanding it. Spend some time studying the Qur'an. Pick those surahs that you have always wanted to study but never got a chance to study. Take some time out during this month to study those surahs. Connect with the Qur'an in this month. Number nine. Pray taraweeh in the masjid. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man qama ramadana imanan wa ihtisadan ghufira lahu ma taqaddama min dhanbi. Whoever spends the month of Ramadan in qiyamul layl, expecting Allah's reward and with faith in Allah, all of his past sins will be forgiven. And Qiyamul Layl in Ramadan includes Taraweeh, even though we call it the Qiyam program, and that only happens in the last 10 days. That's just modern day vernacular. Taraweeh is Qiyam of Ramadan. So when you're praying Taraweeh, you are doing Qiyamul Layl in Ramadan. Okay, you, inshallah, if you do it right, you'll get rewarded for that, and your past sins will be forgiven. 
And if you don't understand Arabic, you don't understand the verses that are going to be recited in the Taraweeh prayers, come 20 minutes before Salat al-Isha, Imam Azhar will do a summary of what's going to be recited, inshaAllah ta'ala. Or if you can't come 20 minutes before Isha because most people are having their iftar at that time, spend some time at home going over the meaning of what's going to be recited. So when you come, you have an idea of what the Imam is reciting so you know what to reflect on during Taraweeh. This will help you concentrate in your Taraweeh prayers. Number 10, Laylatul Qadr. Ramadan is that month in which is that night that is better than 1,000 months. So pray extra hard in the 10 nights, especially the odd nights in those last 10 nights. And remember that if your worship coincides with Laylatul Qadr, it's better than 1,000 months. Number 11. Number 11, I'm just trying to go through these fast. Inshallah, we have some more time for Q&A. Number 11. I'tikaf in the masjid. Wonderful, wonderful opportunity. For those of you who are in uh, high school, this is the last year when the last 10 days will fall during the summer vacation time. Next year, it's going to be during the finals. Because Ramadan is moving up. So I highly recommend that you take advantage of this opportunity and do i'tikaf in the masjid. And inshallah you'll be hearing an announcement related to that soon that, that will make you happy inshallah ta'ala. But the point is do i'tikaf. Whether you're young or old, try to do i'tikaf in the masjid. In the Shafi'i school you don't have to do i'tikaf for 10 days. You can do i'tikaf for one day. You can do i'tikaf for even a few hours. But i'tikaf doesn't mean a sleepover at the masjid. That's not what it means, having a slumber party in the masjid. No. I'tikaf is to be in seclusion with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet sallallahu used to do that every year for 10 days. And sometimes he even did it for 20 days. And one time he even did it for all 30 days. So spend your i'tikaf in total seclusion with your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala and try to taste the sweetness of that. And if you taste that, wallahi al-azim, you will cherish it for the rest of your lives. Number 12. Give charity. This is the month of generosity. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was more generous in this month than the breeze of wind that brings down torrential rains. Ramadan is the month to discipline the nafs. Remember, fasting is one way to do that. Charity is another way to do that. So give as much as you can in this month. And alhamdulillah, in this masjid, we bring you many opportunities to give charity. So take advantage of those opportunities as well. Two more. Number 13. Be on your best behavior. This is the month of taqwa. And remember, taqwa means to guard, to shield. So guard your tongue, guard your eyes, guard your ears. Practice patience and guard your heart. And lastly, be in dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Keep your tongue and your heart busy with the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala no matter where you are. You're driving, you're walking, you're sitting, you're waiting for someone, you're waiting in line. Be in dhikr. At least, at least, develop this habit of doing the azkar after every salah. After every salah, you sit there for five minutes or less and you do the azkar after salah. If you haven't developed that habit yet, Ramadan is the month to develop that habit. And inshallah ta'ala, every day after Fajr, I'm going to be sharing a dua. If you can memorize that dua and make it part of your routine of dua, by the end of the month you'll have close to 30 beautiful duas, whose meanings also you will learn. And inshallah ta'ala, you can use that in the month of Ramadan and outside of the month of Ramadan as well. This is the month in which zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to become part of our lives. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us. I mean, yeah, but I'm going to give it back to him.
inshallah, before we take the questions, which we have, mashallah, quite a few, I just want to explain one more thing to everyone. <clears throat> Physical deprivation is a source of sorrow in our world. If we see someone hungry, we see someone naked, we see someone in a state of destitute, what do we feel for them? We feel sorry. We feel like, I want to help you. You know, is there anything I can do for you? You know, many times we see what's happening overseas, those images, those videos, those pictures, uh, you know, they, they become a part of our mind. Like, we, it, it, it just kind of sticks to our brain. And we want, we feel sorry for them. But just as physical deprivation in our world is a source of so- sorrow, spiritual deprivation will be a source of remorse tomorrow. Tomorrow when we find out that we messed up, we lost opportunities, we never got what we had the opportunity to get. You can't blame anyone tomorrow but yourself. See, the Sahaba were complaining to the Prophet ﷺ that our lifespan of this Ummah is what, 60 to 70 years? And the lifespan of the people before us were hundreds of years. So they got an opportunity to do more and we got less. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in response to that legitimate concern gave us what? Laylatul Qadr. Khairul min al fisha Which is 82 years and 4 months I believe. A thousand months. You can gain 82 years and 4 months worth of worship in one night in these 30 nights of Ramadan. And no, Laylatul Qadr isn't the 27th night. It can be the 27th night. So that culture has to break also. Because the whole year I'll do what I want, I'll come on the 27th night for half an hour, pray to Allah, yes I got my, my thousand months and off I go. You know, let's, let us treat Allah like we would want to be treated with that honor and respect. Let's not make the, the month of Ramadan or Allah a joke. Where we just, you know, I'll use you when I need you type of thing. Now what was the spiritual deprivation that happened at the time of Rasulullah Wasallam that was deprived, that deprived them and deprived the Ummah? was the night of Laylatul Qadr. The Prophet Sallallahu is in his house, or he's, uh, he, was, he was in his residence, and Jibreel Alayhi came and told him Laylatul Qadr. And he told him when it was. And he's so happy, oh my Allah, we got this. You wanted it, we got it, I'm going to go and tell the world. And he exited, and guess what happened? Two Sahabis were quarreling. They were quarreling. In the month of Ramadan, during this fast, you talk about spirituality and the importance of preserving your deeds. They were quarreling. At that moment, Allah took away from the Prophet ﷺ, the Sahaba ﷺ, and for the entire Ummah till Day of Judgment, when is the night of Qadr? I came to tell you, said Rasulullah Wasallam. I came to inform you of the night of power, but now it's been taken from me. Many narrations say, search it in the last ten nights, search it in the odd nights, everything is there. It went. We lost it. Oh, they can't hear me? Sorry. So it left. We lost it. We lost it because of what? We lost it because of an argument. Now tell me one thing that Ramadan is known for. The moon wars. Star Wars sequel, The Moon Wars. We're not talking about the stars, we're talking about the moon. We fight when it comes to Ramadan. We fight when it comes to Eid. Do you know what you just did? You deprived yourself from the initial blessings and then you deprive yourself of the cumulative amount at the end. Ramadan was wasted. You lost it. We'll talk about the moon tomorrow and I promise you, there's never going to be unity just because we have one Ramadan Eid. It's a fact. And it cannot be one Ramadan Eid because the world is so large and the horizon is so large and there are so many phases of the moon. That's the topic of tomorrow. But remember that Ramadan is the opportunity to identify your sins, root out your sins. How does that happen? Let me tell you one example and I'm end with this. So, a person has a habit of lying and they feel that, you know, they're really sharp. They know how to trick a person and make a buck. But they lie doing it. Ramadan will allow them to realize with their hunger that their lying is costing them. Now they have an option to stop lying, which isn't easy to do, and do something bigger, which is speak the truth. Now how is Ramadan going to help you? And how is the Quran going to help you? Let me explain this to you. 
When a person lies, you have to remember every lie they told to every person. Yes? Because you told a person different stories. Now, now you need to picture your face in my head and say, okay, I told him that, I told her that. Because when someone comes around, I have to keep that story. And the story can have inconsistencies. So lying puts you in a state of insecurity always. I hope no one finds out. Everyone's with me? You know what truthfulness does? It keeps you in a state of ease and your conscience is clear. Now in Ramadan, you got hungry, you realize you've been lying, you're asking Allah help you, you're reading the Qur'an. All you're doing is reading the Qur'an. And then the Qur'an says, وَكُونُوا مَعَ الصَّادِقِينَ O believers, fear Allah and be with the truthful. Because you're not allowing that verse to absorb in you, Allah will test you once again in Ramadan. And this time you're going to be like, no, it, it, it really isn't worth the price that I'm giving you to for. Or, I can't promise you it's going to last you one year. Okay? Now you told the truth. Guess what? You felt at ease. You felt that you released yourself from the shackle of this sin. Guess what? You've tasted the opposite side of a bad habit. Now after Ramadan, inshallah, when shaitan will come back and tell you, why did you lie this time? You'll be like, you know what? I feel better when I told the truth and I don't want to tell the lie anymore. Does that make sense? So Ramadan is the only opportunity. You won't get this opportunity anywhere else. We will go down to your questions, inshallah. And we will end, inshallah, with uh, the schedule of tomorrow, inshallah. Uh, for some reason, Sheikh Aslan is forwarding those questions to me. Uh, I don't know if he's... In. <laughs> oh, he cared. Okay, okay. So uh, the first one, was, which is a beautiful question. Um, the question uh, is uh, for both of us and the request of the answers from any one of us. Uh, on one side, I am doing everything I can do in this holy month of Ramadan. Fasting, five times a day prayer in the masjid, taraweeh, completing one Quran at least in Ramadan. All of these deeds are to please Allah, and I know Allah will be happy with me. On the other side, I am doing things, or I am involved in such things, that Allah will not be happy with me, such as, I live in a house which is on mortgage, I work in a bank, I have life insurance, I have money in the bank, and get, I get interest on it. I have a gas station where I'm selling alcohol. I have a car which is on 1.5% EPR. I don't mind eating from any fast food restaurant, and this goes on. So the first part of the question is, what do you think about all these bad practices? And second part of the question is, that my fasting and other good deeds will be accepted by Allah or not? Good question. Very good question. May Allah bless this individual and their family. Say I mean, everyone. I mean, this is what our deen's about. We're not here to show a farce and a false face or a mask of we're good. We have our problems. So, how do I know? Let me answer two parts and I'll give it to Shaykh Arsalan. The first part you're saying that how do I know that Allah is pleased with me? Sorry, the person said after the list of four things that Allah will be happy with me. You will know Allah is happy with you because of the feeling that you will feel from the deeds that you do. You will know Allah is happy with you from the feeling you get through the deeds that you do. You will feel Allah is happy with you. You will feel Him by your side. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is closer to us in our jugular vein. When you acknowledge Allah being that close and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being that near, and you honoring Allah's presence, tell me Allah, Allah's going to do bad to you? No. So you will know Allah's presence and Allah's pleasure by doing these things. And you will also acknowledge Allah's displeasure through the things that you have articulated. Now, subhanAllah, the fact that you realize these things aren't good is the first step in the process of rectification. It's a process. It's a process. We were at, the scholars were invited to um, an event uh, on Wednesday and the brother who was speaking was talking about that he was working for a bank and he was making X amount of dollars, which was three times the amount he made until he started his new job. He was making three times the amount. But he said, when I was working with that company, he said, at the end of the month, I look at my bank balance, I had nothing. I was drained. But then I took a job which was three times less. It was like one third of what I was making. So he was making 120, now he's making 40. He took a 
big cut when it came to financial. Because by the end of the month, he looked at his, he still had the money in the account. He's like, Alhamdulillah. Like he would turn it off and just, like he put his phone away. He didn't want to give nazar to himself. The thing is, a person who articulates these problems, Allah will then help them find the solution. I want to say, Inshallah. Number one is knowing that there's a problem. Number two is your commitment to changing from that problem because you realize the feeling that you have in your life because of their existence. Right? You know that this is wrong, you see it's being wrong. Now you ask Allah in this month of Ramadan and ask Allah to guide your way. He will guide our way. Look at the story of Ibrahim Islam. He was in search of Allah. Yes or no? He didn't know where Allah was or who Allah was. Maybe my Allah is the sun, it's the moon, it's the stars. He didn't know. But at the end of the day, he said that Inni wajahtu wajhiya lil ladhi fatara samawatu wa I turn my face to the one who created all these things. And who did he become? The friend of Allah. So Allah will put you in a position in your life where he will then give you that light of understanding to see what's wrong. And now you have the opportunity to make that path. You ask for it, you seek it, you're honest for it, and Allah will make it happen, inshallah. Inshallah. Sheikh, anything to say on that? All right, so let me take another question, inshallah. There's one question here that says that my mom has been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. She's from time to time get dizzy during the day and tends to get better when she eats. Last year we told her not to fast, but she insisted on fasting. And mashallah, she was able to fast the whole month, but sometimes she hardly made it through Maghrib. You could see how suffering, she, how, how much she was suffering. This year, we've been telling her not to fast, but she's still insisting that she'll fast, inshallah. Any advice for her? First of all, this should put all of us young people to shame. Okay. Yani, a lady who is older, who is diagnosed with diabetes, she has such a passion to fast, mashallah. And we, who make all kinds of excuses, even though... We, mashallah, are young and strong and can do so much. So take advantage of your youth before you get old. Take advantage of your health before you get sick. As for my advice to this questioner, I advise you to remind your family member that the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah loves for his servant to take his confessions just as he loves for his servants to take the harder road. Allah has given you a concession. It's a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why are you refusing to take it? You don't have to fast. You are in a situation where fasting will harm you. If I understand the question correctly, if fasting will harm you physically, health-wise, then for you to still fast is actually potential for making Allah angry because Allah says do not kill yourselves and Rasulullah says there is no harm in this religion nor reciprocating of harm so the point is that remind your family member that Allah has given you the concession not to fast and give fidya instead or to make up the fast later if that's possible so take that concession from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your body is an amana from Allah. Allah didn't tell us to fast so we harm this body. We don't have right to do that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. A question regarding uh, the history. Someone joined late. Inshallah you can watch the live stream once it's uploaded on YouTube. Uh, PlainoMasjid.org has uh, live streaming of what happens in this masjid and we also have our YouTube channel if you go to YouTube and you and you search uh, Plano Masjid you can subscribe to that channel and watch any of the programs that were done previously inshallah uh, is it haram to vape? So I brought up the word vaping and someone asked let me make this very simple um, anything that you do that will harm your body or harm the people around you is haram it's very simple. I'm not a doctor, I'm not a scientist, I'm not here to prove things, but I have read articles that came out on when hookah became the norm and like hookah started trending, that how uh, hookah is equivalent to smoking X so many packages of cigarettes 
and we know what cigarettes can do to a person and we know what secondhand smoke could do to a person. So I'm not here to give a fatwa. I'm just going to say this. Anything that you do that can harm you or harm the people around you is haram. Because this body has been entrusted to you by Allah. You don't own yourself. You don't own your lungs. You don't own your eyes. You don't own your skin. So when you want to ink your skin, just remember you don't own it. It's like graffiti on someone's house or painting someone's car purple with rims. Like, it's not your car. You can't do that. Just keep that in mind, inshallah. Uh, for someone who's saying that they cannot fast because they have body pain and they're on strong painkillers and they feel guilty, what should they do? What should they do? Again, if you have certain health conditions, that may prevent you from fasting. Number one, you go to a physician and you get checked out how bad it is. And they are advisors to let you know if fasting is going to be harmful or not. If you cannot fast this year due to a health reason, just say, I can't fast this year, Ramadan, Sheikh, because